Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're fixing to get started. First thing, uh, we have uh, these restrooms right here. That's right outside the door here that we have to use. They're, they're closed. Can't use them. You have to go over here in the building, uh, the uh, fellowship hall, and uh, over there. Or the youth room, it's open. So uh, you can use those restrooms, but we can't use these two right here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love, Lord. And I just uh, ask you, Lord, as we come into your presence, Father, Lord, we just ask that you lead us through this uh, time, through this hour, Lord, through this day, Father, as we go through the things that, we, uh, that we're that we doing today, Father, through uh, Miss Jones' uh, funeral. And, and Lord, we just ask that you be with... Uh, with a family, Father. Lord, I just lift them up to you right now, Lord, and just, Lord, let them know that you're near. Father, I just thank you again for loving us the way you do, and just ask you to be with Brother Mike as he brings your lesson, Father, and Lord, as, uh, as we listen, Lord, help us to hear your word. Be with uh, Waylon as he brings a song service, Lord, just to give it, put us in that, in that worshipful spirit, Father, that we can uh, come to you and Lord, come to know you better, each, uh, each word that spoke. Thank you again for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, as Danny mentioned, Ms. Joan Kyle's services will be here at 3 o'clock this evening. Visitation will be at starting at one so this we'll feed the family at five so this evening we'll not have evening services here at the church so it's be all day so let's just spend all day with praying for her family uh <coughs> y'all can read the rest of these announcements in the bulletin one special request that we've had Gene Mills from Louisiana Family Forum has asked us to pray specifically for this special session, the override to veto session that's coming up. Uh, the Senate voted for 80% to pass a bill to prohibit, or it's called the Fairness in Women's Sports Act, to keep men from participating in women's sports. Governor Edwards vetoed it. So this special session is to override that veto. And so the family, Louisiana Family Forum, has asked us to pray specifically for this item. Uh, today and Tuesday when the special session starts. So I'm going to say a prayer just for this this morning. And uh, then we'll turn it over, Brother Wayne. Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this beautiful day to come and worship you. God, as we come before you right now, Father, we've been asked to pray for this special need that's coming before our state, Lord. God, that this law to keep men from participating in women's sports, Father, Lord, it's just so crazy, and we just ask that your will be done in this, Father. Oh, God, I just pray that you will give all of our elected officials the wisdom and the knowledge to take care of this in a way that's pleasing unto you, Father. God, I just pray that we as a congregation continue to lift this up all this week as they're in special session. Father, I just pray that it'll be a special time. And Father, that you'll get the glory for it. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We stand amazed in the presence of Jesus our Lord. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever for me in me in 
the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own grief but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me when with the ransomed in glory his face i at last shall see twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. There's a holy hush around us as God's glory fills this place. I've touched the hem of his garment. I can almost see his face, and my heart is overflowing with the fullness of his joy. I know without a doubt that I've been with the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. 
I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Y'all have a seat.
Yeah. 
seat. For leading our worship this morning. It's going to be a full day today, a lot going on. And so we're going to begin by letting the children go out for children's church this morning. And so let them exit the building right now. We can pick them up back in the children's department at the close of the service. All right. Once they all get out, there's plenty of room, plenty of seats left over, and so you make yourself comfortable somewhere this morning. All right, we're going to be in John chapter 8 this morning. John chapter 8 is I'm preaching through the gospel of John today, and so in case you're wondering, just before any of you start wondering, uh, I've gone back to my, King, my new King James version of the Bible, so I told you all a while back I swapped over to the... Uh, the Christian, whatever it was, Christian Standard Version, something like that. <laughs> Christian Standard Bible, CSB. Yeah, and uh, I tell you, I've been raised, I've been on King, New King James so long, I just, some of the verses just didn't look right, so I had to go back. So, if any of you went and bought Bibles, uh, Jerry Wagner back here will reimburse you for any Bibles that you bought of the different translation. Amen. So uh, I just don't want anybody to be out any money, and I knew Jerry would be good for that. So I haven't asked him, so be careful when you go to him. All right. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, I want to begin by saying, first of all, we got here this morning. But before I got here, they got here, and the water spewing in the front of the sanctuary out there. Somebody ran over the water, meeting, water meter during the night, and uh, Brother Wayne has been out there fixing that all morning, and we appreciate Brother Wayne Muscle White, and uh, Ronnie's been out there helping him some, and uh, Larry's been watching, and Mike's been watching, and so anyway, I just want to get that all out there. He's had some watchers. Look like the highway department working out there. I didn't know what was going on. But anyway, uh, anyway, uh, special appreciation to Brother Wayne. You thank him for doing that for us. That's not his job. He does that as a servant, and we appreciate him doing that. So I want to commend him. At the same time, I want to criticize someone here today. I want to criticize Miss Katie uh, because every morning I wake up, and she puts on the, she puts on the, on the Facebook how far she ran that day. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about, you're talking about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I got the Holy Spirit convicting me every time I do something wrong, and I got Katie convicting me for being lazy. So I don't know how I have to deal with that. So uh, she don't do anything. It's just, uh, it's just my conscience, Miss Katie. You know, I have RLS, so I don't have to exercise. That's restless leg syndrome, or I call it uh, real loser, <laughs> real loser syndrome, but I don't know, uh, real lazy syndrome, maybe that's what it is, but uh, uh, my legs move all night long, so I don't have to get up and run in the morning, so uh, it's kind of a good deal, me and God got worked out, they exercise while I sleep, and so, uh, but anyway, uh, thanks for making me feel guilty anyway, Miss Katie, and uh, <laughs> it doesn't last very long till I get my first cup of coffee and get my first donut, and then I'm good, all right. So, uh, but anyway, this morning we'll begin in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 13. And we're going to look at really the reasons people miss Jesus. This chapter is really about, about the Lord just walking with people, and they missed it. They missed out on who He was. You know, that happens all around us today. I mean, God is everywhere. You can see the beauty and the amazement of God's creation and God's handiwork. Someone said you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. Well, you can't see God, but you can sure see the effects of God. And so uh, he's all around us today, and we just have to look for the Lord and see what he's doing and praise him for what he does. I want to point out four things this morning that I believe are reasons why people uh, miss and reject the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as our Lord and our Savior. And uh, beginning in verse 13, I want to read down through verse 20 this morning. Would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible Word today? And uh, if 
thank you for all the prayers we've known this weekend and today and uh, for Dawn's family. And so I just say thank you to all of you who've been uh, lifting us up in prayer this weekend. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. And, but, and maybe that's a good question for all of us this morning. Do you know where you've come from and do you know where you're going? Well, that's a good word there. And you do not know where I came from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, and I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. I, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself. The Father who sent me also bears witness of me. You may remember there when he was baptized, the Father said from heaven, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And he told him other times, Hear him. And so here he said, and when they said to him, where is your father? And Jesus indeed says, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury that as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. Now we're going to use some of the rest of this chapter, but I'm going to stop there. Fathers, we read these scriptures today. We are reminded of your holiness. We are reminded of your deity and that you are God, and there is no other. And we're reminded today that, God, we know where you came from, and we know where you went to. And we know that you're coming back for us one day. And, Father, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know that, who doesn't know that you're their God, and that you're coming back for them, oh, Lord, I pray that before they leave this place today, that they will make that decision to know that they're a part of the family of God. And that you're coming back for them. And so, Lord, we just pray your blessings, your anointing upon the preaching of your word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. You know, nowhere in the Bible do we find where Jesus is making people who who are not right with God feel comfortable with their, their unbelief. Or their choice in life. In fact, right prior to this, you may remember last week I preached on the woman who was taken in adultery, and he didn't say it's okay. You've chosen a lifestyle of adultery, and and that's okay. Nobody cares. It's fine. Go ahead. And but instead, he, after sharing with her, he poured out grace upon her, and he said to her, "Now go, and sin no more," because he saw her brokenness. He challenged her. He rebuked her, and he said to her, basically, sin. No more. Don't live that lifestyle. Go another way. Here in this encounter in the temple, the holy place of Jerusalem, he's confronted by religious leaders, religious people of his day. In fact, he challenges people time and again to experience a life-changing faith. Life-changing faith that you will never be the same again. Listen to me. If you meet and accept Jesus Christ, you will never be the same again. In fact, he says you'll change like from a a goat to a sheep. He says you'll undergo a metamorphosis. He said like a, like a, a, a worm to a caterpillar to a butterfly. He says you'll become a something totally new and old things will be passed away from you. And we're reminded of that today, that what a relationship with Jesus Christ will do. He will make us a new creation. And that's good news to you today. The loss of Miss Joan this week and, uh, and uh, her family was able to come together. Good family, good kids, grandkids, families was all able to come together and, and accept it and face it, even though it was painful, because they knew that God had this. They knew she was in a better place, and they knew that God had her in His hands. Now, I don't know how people handle death if they don't have that assurance. I'd hate to think of death where there's no, no assurance of the life that God has it in His hands. To know that whatever we face on the other side of that last heartbeat and that last breath, 
is good and not bad. Oh, my friend, that's what Jesus brought to the world. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that was his desire, his passion, his heartbeat. And so we think about that today as Jesus meets here in the temple. He's in the temple. He's there teaching people why he wants them to know the Father. And he wants to show them the Father. You see, that's the reason Jesus came, God in the flesh. Fully God, fully man, he came in man's language, in man's uh, uh, relationships to teach them about the Father. To not only teach them about the Father, but to show them the Father. And that's why here he says, you don't know the Father because you don't even know me. And I'm here to show you the Father. And don't think I'm just the one making that up or this one verse. Time and again, the Bible says, Jesus in the Scripture says, in Colossians and other places, it tells us that there is one God, and it tells us that He has revealed Himself in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, there is, and that that God, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And so the Bible's real clear about that, helping us understand that God has a plan for us. He has a plan to help us to know that God and to be set free by that God. Today at 3 o'clock, we will have a memorial service here for Miss Joan. One of the things that we'll talk about in that service is God's saints and death. We don't like to talk about death very much. But you know, one of the things that's so true is that people fear death. And the good news is, we don't have to. Well, I know one who's conquered death and hell. I know one who's overcome the grave, the Bible says, in this old world. I know one who's destroyed the last enemy, which is death. I'm here to tell you something, and he'll hold me by the hand and lead me from this life to the next life. The Bible says to be absent of this old body is to be present with the Lord. I don't have to fear death. Why do people fear death? They fear it because they don't know what's next sometimes. Or they may fear how they're going to pass or when they're going to pass. But the good news is we don't have to fear it. That's because of Jesus. He wanted to tell people how they could have life and have life eternal. And yet many miss that by trying to keep a set of religious rules. But they miss out on the beauty of of a relationship with God Himself. And so we're going to look at this today and see what God says about the temple. Here we see the first thing I want you to see, the reason people miss God. Because they have a lack of awareness. They have a lack of awareness of who God is. A, a lack of understanding of who God is. You know, we're living in a world today that doesn't seem to know who God is. They think God is some great social worker up in heaven somewhere. Or they think God ought to solve every... Some people have trouble believing in God today because they see bad in the world. They say if there was God, there was a God, there surely wouldn't be all these bad in the world. There wouldn't be all this pain in the world. There wouldn't be all this injustice in the world. I'm here to tell you there's going to come a day like that, but that's called heaven. And pardon my grammar, but this ain't it. This ain't it. This is an old world today where the devil is the God of this world. The Bible says that. He's the little g, God of this world. In fact, the Bible tells us that most people are going to follow him. That's the hard thing for me to understand. How could anybody, when they know about a God who would give them release and freedom and love and forgiveness and hope, how, how many of those people would say, yeah, well, I know that sounds maybe good to some people, but I just, I'll pass. I'll pass. That's like saying to somebody, I want to give you a million dollars cash, and them saying, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, don't need it. I'll pass. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me that someone would have that attitude. But the Bible says Satan has blinded people to the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel is you're not what God made you to be, but God has come to help make you what he wanted you to be. And that's through Jesus Christ. That's the simple message of the world. Some people say, what's so tough about being a pastor? I said, I've got one message. Man's a failure. God will heal him, make him better. And God will come back after him for all eternity one day. 
I got, that's the only message I have. And I got to find a way to preach that same message three times a week for the rest of my life. Amen? Yeah, that makes it a little complicated to try to keep that one simple message new and fresh and in some way something else to learn three times a week. But how important that is for us to know that message. In the book of Hosea chapter 4, it tells us time and again that Hosea, the prophet, was concerned about Israel's lack of knowledge of God. In fact, when we see Israel many times drifting away from God, we find out that Israel uh, forgot about it. In fact, there, it says there arose a generation that knew not the mighty works of God and all the things that God had done for them in delivering them out of captivity in Egypt and leading them to the promised land. Some reason, some way, a generation forgot all about that. Why did that happen? Because nobody, somebody fumbled the ball and nobody picked it up and taught it. You know, the little book of Jude, the next to the last book in the New Testament, the little bitty one chapter book of Jude, the theme of that little one chapter book, he said this, he said, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. But Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, said, but instead of writing to you about our common salvation, I was just impressed by the Holy Spirit to write to you to what? Does anybody remember what that book says? To do what? To contend for the faith. You know what that means? Pick up the ball, carry it, pass it off to the next generation. The faith. We have to pick up the ball and pass off the faith to the next generation. And if we don't do that, we see generations arise that knew not the mighty works of God, that did not hear the stories that their parents told them about their answered prayers about how God had blessed them, about how God had saved them, about all the great things of God. You know, as Americans, we've forgotten to tell our children, and part of that may be education, but in many places in America today, we don't want our children to know about the godly roots and founding of this great nation. We don't want to tell them about how God had a hand in founding this nation. So now we're raising a generation of almost secular atheists that believe that we were just another nation that just stole this land from other people and God had no part of it. I'm not saying there haven't been mistakes in our past, but I'm here saying to you today that God had a hand in the founding of this great nation. And anybody that says other than that is a liar and the truth is not in them. And I want you to understand that today we have a responsibility to pass off the Word of God and the goodness of God and the greatness of God to the next generation. There was a lack of awareness of who God was in European countries. Many great movements have taken place. Many great awakenings have taken place. But today there's just a shell of Christianity. While I was working in South Africa one time, some, I was working with uh, Multi Ministries International, and a group of ministers from, from England came down there and met with Multi Ministries, and they said, listen, we need y'all to come up here and help us. Show us how to win people to Jesus Christ. We don't know how. And that was the ministers. That wasn't the lay people. And that's why today less than 2%, less than 2% of Europe is Christian. Muslims are taking over today, uh, predominantly in, in Europe. In fact, in fact, they predict that Europe will be a, a Muslim continent, if you will, uh, in the year or area in the year by the year 2035. will be predominantly Muslim. Because somebody fumbled the ball and didn't take the faith and pass it off to the next generation. That's what was going on here. The real faith, there was just a lack of knowing of who God was. They thought God was a bunch of rules and regulations instead of someone that they could have a personal relationship with. They wanted God to be someone that you couldn't really know God. You could talk to somebody about God, and they could talk to God for you, but you couldn't go directly to God yourself. Friends, I want you to know something. Even that's taught some places today. I want you to know you don't have to go through anybody to get to God. God says, you can come straight to me. Talk to me like a friend, because I want to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother, the Bible says. And so think about that today. I want you to understand that Jesus tells these old Pharisees, you don't know the truth because you don't know me. 
And if you knew me, you'd know the truth. I wonder how many times they walked right beside the Lord, much like I, the one person, you know, that blows my mind is old Judas, that disciple Judas. How he could walk with the Lord, camp out with the Lord, sit around a fire with the Lord, and really never be saved and be called a son of perdition in the end and take his own life. Who is the, who, who's around the Lord today, but they're missing out on God. They're missing out on the goodness of God. Maybe they're trying to keep, you may be a religious person trying to keep some rules. There are folks that will go to church today that don't any more believe in God than a man in the moon. They'll go because it's kind of a societal thing and they want to fit in and they want to make friends. I've known folks go to church for their business. They figured they could make contacts to get more business by going to church. And sometimes we just go and we get so self-righteous that we think by just keeping a few rules, we'll be okay with God. But the fact is, you can still miss God. If you don't have that relationship with Him, to know Him, to receive Him, and to love Him. Verse 15 says that they'll, uh, some people judge, but the Lord says, I don't have to judge. I know what's in, basically, I know what's in a man's heart. And so here we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Down in verse 23, Jesus tells them that you, you don't have anything spiritual or heavenly in you. Uh, look, at, look at verse 23, if you skip on that. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Jesus basically tells them you, don't have a, you haven't received a kingdom mindset. You know, that's one of the things that will change about you when you get saved. You'll develop a kingdom mindset mindset. You'll develop new priorities, what's important to you in your life. You, you'll say, I want to, I care about the things of God. I, you'll start thinking about the things of God. Jesus looked at them. He said, you're keeping a bunch of rules, but he said, you're just focused on the world. You're not focused on eternity and the things of God. And so a real indictment upon them, a lack of awareness. The second thing, a lack of application. I want you to see what he means by lack of application of what he says. You know, you can sit in church all the time in the world. You can sit in church and sit in church and sit in church, but if you don't apply what God says to you in a Sunday school class or in your quiet time or in a sermon that I preach, if you don't apply that in your life, it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do us any good if we don't start living it. We've got to live by it. I, mean, I want to ask you, and I've said this here before about our faith. Faith is a wonderful thing. Faith can move mountains. But faith kept in a jar and never brought out is of no value whatsoever to you. It may be a saving faith. It may be enough that you got saved. But listen, folks, God didn't just save you and fill you with His Spirit and fill you with faith for you not to use it seven days a week in your life. Faith is not just a Sunday thing. Faith is a Monday thing, and it helps you get through the, the day in the world. I'm going to tell you, I think you need faith more on Monday than you need it on Sunday. Amen? You need it more when you get out in the world and the old devil's attacking you, and, and boy, everything seems to be going wrong. And so here we see that there's a lack of actually. Look what verse 37 says. Skip down to verse 37. I don't have time to do all these verses. This is, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Jesus says to them, you guys, you, you hear it, but you don't care about it. You don't care what I have. It hasn't taken root in your life. Here's what has to happen. The word of God has to go in your ear. And then it goes into your mind, which is the filter of what you allow to go to your heart. And the Bible says what you allow to go to your heart will take root, and that's what will come out of your life. You know, sometimes the, the, the uh, words of God may get into our mind, and, and it just gets bogged down. You remember the story of the parable of the wheat and the, not the wheat and the tares, the, the seed and the soil, and how that, that Jesus talks about the, the seed being sown, and it fell on four different types of soil. Some was on, on rock, actually, and the birds ate it up and didn't do any good. Some fell with just a little bit of dirt. And, and it sprang up, and it, it died away real quick. And, and then he says that some of it fell among the thorns and the thistles, and it got choked out. Sometimes we're so busy in this life that our mind's about like the thorns and the thistles. Word of God just gets thrown up into all the garbage in our heads, and there's no room for it to produce what God wants it to produce. There's no room for it to produce fruit in our life. 
Well, preacher, what do you mean? I'm not, what do you mean by a clogged up mind? Well, some of us, we're so busy listening to country and western music that we ain't got nothing else. We, all we can think about, I don't know whether you do or don't, but I don't, know, I don't have any names handy, but so, sometimes it's that. Sometimes we, we're so full of Facebook, we ain't got time to think about the Word of God. And sometimes we just want to gossip, 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 and we just want to hear what's going on in everybody else's life. And, and, and sometimes it may be the television, or sometimes it may be this, or it may be that. And our minds are so, so just so pitifully clogged with stuff, the Internet. I'm hoping one day we get to the end of the Internet. Somebody unplugs that thing. But, but you know, we, we, stuff gets so clogged that we get to thinking about so much stuff that the Word of God don't have room to grow. How important is it that we find a time to get along with God and hear God? That we have the Word of God planted in our heart, and it doesn't get clodded up in our mind. The fourth type of soil was a fertile soil. The seed fell on that soil, and it sprang forth, and it produced fruit 30, 50, 100 times uh, beyond what was planted, and, and it was beneficial. And that's what we ought to be. That ought to be the believer. The believer ought to be the one that definitely is the... I know at least the last one was saved. Four different types of mindsets. Some say maybe three were saved, everything but the hard soil. Some say maybe only one was saved. I don't know. Those, if it fell on the, 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 the narrow soil or the, th- the choked out soil, definitely those would be carnal Christians who just hadn't had time to let God's Word meditate in their hearts. So it's so important that we understand. Now, let me give you an example of that. An example of that would be... Uh, in Russia, in Kalinovsk, uh, in Russia, a priest began uh, giving candy to kids who memorialized Scripture, who memorized Scripture. And one little overweight, pug-nosed boy used to memorize Scripture so good, he'd come and he'd wait in the back and he'd get up and say his little Scriptures and he'd run up and get his candy and he'd run away. Man, year after year, that happened. And uh, eventually the boy won a grand prize. He literally memorized all four of the Gospels. Pretty unique, isn't it? This little boy died at the age of 60. The name on his tombstone was Nikita Khrushchev, communist premier of the USSR. You see, he memorized a lot of words up here, but it never got down here. Because if it had gotten down here, He'd have never been a communist. He'd have never killed millions of people like he did. You see, the words need to take root and produce fruit in the heart. Number three, the reason people miss Jesus is, first of all, the awareness, no awareness, no application, and a lack of assessment of what we need. Look at verse 44. If you'll skip down to verse 44, look what it says. You are your father, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Some of y'all think I was blunt. Jesus is a little more blunt than I am right there. Amen. He's putting it real blunt out there. His desires, your desires, had come from your father, the devil. And he's asking them, your desires, what's important to you? What's important to you? He says, you, 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 you want, you're more concerned about, about keeping people down. You're more concerned about correcting people. You're more concerned about showing how righteous you are. You see, the Pharisees used to walk around with their nose up in the air like this because they were too righteous to look at the, 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 the uh, lesser believers of their day so they didn't want to look at them and they walked around like this they were called the bleeding pharisees they constantly tripped over stuff and fell and constantly had skin up knees because they didn't watch where they were going and and these old pharisees were so self-righteous and their priorities weren't god's priorities it was about correcting everybody and, and punishing everybody and they weren't as concerned about who they could help and who they could minister to, and who they could love on, and who needed to know God, they were just concerned about showing how much of God they were like. 
And so we look at this today, and we're reminded that our, our desires, what we do, our priorities, they say so much about who we are. I don't know how many of you will be back to Miss Jones' memorial today, but one of the things about Miss Jones was she was such a sacrificer. She gave so much. She never had much. But if she had a little bit and you needed it, you could have it. That's just, I mean, that tells us who we are. Not that you gave out of your plenty. You remember Jesus pointed out the little woman who had the two, the two uh, denarii, half pennies. He talked about she gave more than all the rest of you. Why? That was all she had. She gave it all. You know, there's probably nothing that defines our heart more than giving. Because that's who God is. God's a giver. He gave His only begotten Son. He gave us forgiveness. He gave us grace. He gave us mercy. We didn't deserve any of that. He gives us righteousness. He gives us His holiness. We just have to receive it. And that defines Him. And He's saying to these Pharisees here, you don't get it. You, you, you don't understand what's important. And he says to them, and I believe it stands to show the Word of God is called a double-edged sword, cutting, dividing the asunder of soul and spirit, and, and just penetrating the heart. And it'll change you if you'll let it. And their, their assessment of what they needed was definitely out of kilter. And last of all, their ex lack of acceptance. Acceptance of what he can do. Acceptance of who he was for their lives. If you look right down at the end, beginning in verse 51, they're religious. He, he said to them, look at verse 51. He said, he said, most surely I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. And then the Jews said to him, now, now we know you have a, a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophet's and you say, if anyone keeps my words, he shall never taste death. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? Well, then no one can be greater than father Abraham. I love this part. Please, please see this. And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered and said, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father who honors me, of whom you Say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And, that, and I say, I do not know him. I shall, if I say I don't know him, I shall be a liar like you. But, but I do know him, and I keep his word. And then look at verse 56 here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. You know what that means? Jesus said, when I was packing up to leave heaven to come down here to die for the sins of mankind, Abraham saw it. Let me put it in a little Okaloosa translation for you. He hugged my neck. He packed me a lunch. And he said, go get them, Jesus. He was happy to see the plan of God. And you can imagine these Pharisees went ballistic. The Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, most surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's the great I am. He was there at the burning bush. He said when told old Moses, he said when they asked, when they asked, who do I tell them sent me? He said, you just tell them I am sent you. I am the living water. I am that Prince of Peace, I am. Oh, the Bible's just full of great I am statements. When they came to arrest him, they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus stepped forward and he said, I am. That was the identifier of who Jesus was. What did that mean? 
It means I'm the one who always was and always will be. That's what that statement meant. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All wrapped up in two little bitty words, I am. So here we look at this text of Scripture today. We're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ is everything. It says in verse 59 that those, maybe those same stones, I don't know, maybe those same stones that they dropped in the first ten verses of this chapter, when they didn't stone the woman for adultery, maybe they decided to pick them back up. And it says they took up stones to throw at him. And he hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by. Oh, my friend. We have responsibility of how we handle the truth. And how we handle the truth, the world may not always accept it. The church may not always accept it. I'm here to tell you today that I, I preach a Jesus that will change your life. I preach a Jesus that's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him. I preach a Jesus that without Him you can't be saved. I preach a Jesus that calls us to repent of our sins and turn from that sin and repent of that sin and trust Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you there's churches that don't want to hear that message. I preach a Jesus that, tells us, that will tell us what truth is, that will show us what sin is. And He expects us to turn our backs on sin. He expects us to turn away from the world and experience the grace of God. I'm here to tell you today that the world doesn't always understand that. And the world sometimes will hate us for truth. They hated Jesus, he said, and they'll hate us sometimes. But the challenge that you have to decide is if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that means you're going to be a follower of truth. You're going to stand for the truth no matter what the cost. We're living in a day and a time, and apart from a great awakening and a great revival of God, there's going to be hard days ahead. It's going to become harder and harder and harder to stand for truth. And you're going to have to decide whether or not you're going to stand for truth. If you live very much longer, you're going to have to decide whose side you're on. Because, my friend, there are people today losing jobs because of truth. There are people today losing friends because of truth. There are people today threatened with their life because of truth. You have to decide whether or not you're really one of those who are for the truth of God. And you believe that Jesus is truly the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man will come to the Father except through Him. The way of the Pharisees doesn't work. By being self-righteous, does that get you to heaven? Let me tell you something. If you've committed one sin in your life, you can't go to heaven. Heaven's a place where there's no sin. And the fact is, we all know that we've sinned, haven't we? We all know that we fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. What does the Bible say about that? What's the glory of God? Heaven Heaven is the glory, most glorious place of God. In fact, the Shekinah glory of God lights heaven. There won't even be a need for the sun in heaven. But if you've sinned, you can't go there. So you've got to receive the righteousness of God. How do you get it? You have to decide that you've sinned and you can't save yourself. And you have to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know I can't save myself. But Lord, come into my life. Forgive my sins. I turn from my sin and I turn to you, Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, I place my faith in what you did for me on the cross and how you rose from the dead for me. And from this point on, I'm going to follow you with my life. I don't, you don't have to use those exact words, but that definitely needs to be the thought that comes across in your heart that you're going to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Has that ever happened in your life? Oh, my friend, there's religious people that will miss God. He could be walking all around them just like these Pharisees, and they miss who He is. Have you missed Him? Do you know Him? Is He your Lord and Savior? In the Holy Land, would y'all come on up and get ready? Do you know him today? The song says, please don't turn him away. 
Oh, my friend, he's here today. The Bible says we're two or three gathered together in his name. He's right here in the midst. Do you know him? Would you bow with me all across this room? Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts today. God, if we are here and, and don't have assurance of our salvation and Maybe we're good people like the Pharisees would have been considered good people. <laughs> Maybe we're still out there in the world and we can't make up our mind if we want to live for the fun and the pleasure of the world and the drunkenness and all the, the, the sicknesses of the world out there, whether we want to commit to the truth. Help us decide today, Lord. For today, you're passing by this place. How many would come up and take you by the hand, O oh Lord, and receive you? Today, Lord, speak right now during this invitation. Call people, God. You, you tell us that we can't be saved unless, we, unless we've sensed the call of the Father, the drawing of the Father, the drawing and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, do that today. This is your invitation, God. It's not mine. I just want to facilitate, so have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? If you're here and you don't know what you need to do today, you just come and say, Pastor, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Others of you may want to come to this altar and pray. Some of you may want to move your membership and become a member here. Whatever you need to do, you do it right now. Lord, make me like you. Please make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Oh Lord, I am willing. Do what you must do to make me like you. Make me like you, Lord, make me like you, please make me like you, you are a servant, make me one too. To make me like you, Lord, please make me like you. Well, amen. Thank you for being here today. By the way, Miss Ashley, I saw you hanging on him back there. The youth have a rule, no public displays of affection, so we got to stop that. All right, I just thought you remembered that. <laughs> But we're married, but we're married. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Uh, our family will be here at 1230 for family visitation time. Visitation time starts at 1 today, and it goes to 3 to time for the memorial service, and then the memorial service at 3, and then they're doing a meal for the family. Thank you, church, for providing a meal for the family at 5 today. And so we uh, thank you for making that possible. We will not have a service tonight because of that. And um, everything going on, I'm sure we'll be 6.30 or 7 getting away from here tonight. So thank you for all of you that's prepared a meal or whatever you've done. Thank you for that. Um, I will remind you, tomorrow night we have outreach planned at 6 o'clock tomorrow. And um, don't forget to pray this Tuesday about noon about this override session. They're trying to straighten up. You know, our governor is very political, and he's trying to assure his future right now. And so uh, it's just the stupidest thing in the world to say that we ought to let men participate in women's sports. That's like saying we ought to let men get in children's sports or women play in children's, compete against children, you know. I mean, we just, we've moved into an insane time in our day 
in this day and time. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And that's the truth, whether you like it or not. Amen? And pray, pray, pray that God may raise up a standard against the evil. That's just a symbol of some of the evil that's going on in the world today. Pray that at least our state will take a stand like some other states have done on that. Okay? Thanks for being here today. Brother Ronnie, so good to see you back last week. Would you close us in prayer? Thank you.